Great. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I'm going to look down and read this. Uh, I have a brain injury, uh, so it gives me problems. So I apologize. <sighs> my name is Stephen Michael Digna, Jr. Uh, doctor, I'm sorry. These are slipping my hands here. That's okay. <clears throat> My name is Stephen Michael Digna, Jr. The following testimony is true and inaccurate as that as it can be at this time to the best of my ability, and I have prepared to swear this testimony under oath before the Senate and Congress. <sighs> I'm a former sergeant in the United States Army. I began active duty service in 1999, and I served until 2002. I was assigned to the U.S. Army Training Center, W4J9 Alpha Alpha. Fort Irwin, California, located in the Mojave Desert inside uh, Death Valley near the Barstow, California in 2000. <sighs> I was assigned to Alpha Company Group, Live Fire Combat Engineer Division, uh, Computer Sport Systems, and uh, basically for civilians, it's management for live fire operations. I acted as a hub between the operations group, intelligence planners, ground team, Air Force, and Star Wars programs. Uh, thank you, Doctor. In July of 2001, I was observing a live fire practice uh, at a live hole from an, uh, an observation deck at approximately three stories high from the desert floor. I saw a craft in the distance at approximately 200 feet off the ground, measuring 100, approximately 172 feet across, strongly, strongly remembers it, resembling a hovering B-2 spirit. Upon first glance, my eyes were adjusting to the darkness. I could see seven lights in a V-shape. <sighs> After that, I closed my eyes for approximately 30 seconds to allow them to adjust the lighting conditions. We were running red lights throughout the bunker due to the current live fire uh, exercise. The range was hot. That means rounds are being fired and lives are at risk at all times. Uh, this was interrupted by a, a very, very ominous call, a net call. It said, cease fire, cease fire, cease fire. It came from one of our observer controllers on the ground. There was about 20, 27 teams out there. Uh, and they, uh, they kept soldiers alive and trained them. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you, Doctor. Once my eyes adjusted, I could make out the general shape of the craft. There were two men from Raytheon present. I pulled out my night vision goggles to get a better look at the craft. Uh, it appeared to be generating seven lights along its wings and underbelly. I noticed another smaller craft oriented on the right side at the, and at the same height as the first craft, approximately 75 feet to 100 yards to its right. The second craft was jet black, V-shaped, pointed towards the first craft. This craft had equally joined, spaced, rectangular sections forming the hull. The craft had a gimbal rack on, that deployed from the bottom of the craft, uh, approximately five to six holographic uh, lights. Uh, holographic emitting uh, lights were uh, pointed directly at the first craft. That was my assumption. Uh, due to the fact that they were displaying a strange color within my MVG goggles. Anyone that knows the old school, you know, two, circa 2000 MVGs, they don't emit color. They give you green, grays, and blacks. I was seeing colors within my night vision goggles. This was not normal. And uh, it was my assumption that perhaps these, this was a hologram being projected from the other craft. Uh, I can't confirm that. However, that was uh, my assessment at the time and my suspicion at the time. I wanted to throw a baseball at it but I didn't have one, just to see if it was tangible and solid. The second craft was uh, jet black, V-shaped. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, jumped a little space here. Thank you for the bullets, uh, Raven. The craft and the gimbal rack were deployed from the bottom of the craft and approximately five or six lights. Sorry, Dr. Greer. Guys, I, I, I goofed up, and that's a part of the brain injury suffered during an explosion on the live fire range. One of the two men on the observation deck, uh, observation deck from Raytheon, Noticed the night vision goggles I had. He went from chattering cheerfully. Uh, they were pretty relaxed. They'd seen these before. It wasn't abnormal to them. Uh, uh, he looked at me with a very, very severe uh, look of disapproval and anger uh, that I had. Uh, at that point, we both, uh, they both went calmly inside, probably a little bit angry, and uh, it felt as though I had crossed the line. I took another uh, look with my night vision goggles. The reason this event was not uh, reported uh, was due to the fact that it was not unidentified. I'm going to repeat this very clearly to the cameras. This craft was not unidentified. This was on our birds, and uh, 
to the observer controller that called that out on the range. I'm not going to put his call sign out. Uh, Roger up, eyes on, hands on confirmation. That's our bird, but she doesn't un need w wind to get lift. She was hovering stationary. Uh, this was, uh, I'm going to interject here. Sorry, guys. This was very dangerous. This, light, this craft showed up uh, un unscheduled. I got no notification. My job was to maintain command and control and to be the hub and uh, top observer controller for the tactical operation consent, uh, command center for live fire desert warfare. That's the largest live fire warfare center for desert warfare on the planet and uh, in history. So uh, any, any moving objects that are on that, dinner, uh, on that desert uh, floor or in those skies are supposed to be coordinated between myself and another group uh, that I directly worked with with the uh, civilian personnel through Raytheon and the Air, United States Air Force. Uh, so to get back to the statements here, uh, the reason this the event was uh, not re oh, skip. All right, well this is going to jump in a little. I was the fastest promoted soldier in 25 years on the post, uh, and I was the youngest number one control seat holder uh, at Fort Irwin NTC facility in history. Uh, that held the title, the voice of the desert. Uh, when I cued my mic at my FM base station, it shut down all radios and I could shut down the, the range for safety reasons or for medevac calls, safety reports, weather reports, and any other thing that was commanded by me by my uh, superiors. Uh, <clears throat> I skipped over that, but I filled it in good. Approximately five to seven uh, days later, the... <sighs> Sorry, guys, this is personal. Uh, this affected the rest of my marriage, my life, and uh, my relationship with my child. <sighs> Approximately five to seven days later, follow the following incident took place on Fort Irwin Road. It's the one road leading uh, into the base. During the weekend pass, after the show, uh, my wife and I had uh, taken a pass to go see a movie, um, and it, this this took place right after the live fire bunker, about five seven five to seven days afterwards. <sighs> we skipped the second movie, or halfway through. Uh, I was really tired; just got back from running a range, uh, seventy eight hour shifts with no relief. We passed a dry lake bed on the right hand side. I've got that exact information already turned into the proper authorities. Thank you. Dr. Greer and all of his team, um, people out there, please get ready to come out. This is a saying they got an old uh, old friend of mine, well, a new friend, but uh, he reminded me of an old saying they have at Fort Benning, Georgia. It says, follow me. There's another saying we have at the Signal Corps Academy. It's, uh, it's on the badge. It says, Propatria Vigilanus, or Vigilus. That means watchful of the nation. And there's another group of men that I served with, and I tried to keep them alive every day to the best of my ability. Same guys that blew me up. And I still love them today, and I ask for amnesty for all of the information I'm going to say from here on in. Is uh, These boys are on the ground on the hottest spots in the planet, along with these other soldiers, and they're dying out there. They're out there killing people under false pretenses. I've also turned information in that may be able to prove that to the proper authorities, thanks to Dr. Greer and his team. His team so far has been accommodating, polite, honest, respectful, and this man is my new general. He leads the way. So rally up, rally on me. This man is the way. He speaks the truth. He is sound. Apologize, Dr. Greer. I've been waiting to say that for a long time. Uh, I thought they would laugh at me and look at me like I'm a lunatic. However, I brought my data. I brought the, I brought the information. They stripped my information, said I had a driver's badge and a service ribbon. Uh, I had two accommodation medals, and I had total seven certificates. They put me in for an ARCOM, which is the highest award you can get for, uh, for a non-deployable base. I'm a non-combatant, but I'm as close as you can get to being one. Those boys out there, we receive KIT reports every day. That means killed in training. Had I been in a real tactical operation command center uh, or bunker on the range, like the one that just got hit in Ukraine, then I'd be sending men out to die every day. Those guys hated the voice of the desert because we gave them to commands to send their troops into danger and to death, even if we knew that they were just the decoys for the real mission. So I'm going to have to jump back to this. I apologize, Raven and everyone, for, for going off track, but that had to be said. Uh, roof. 
Back to the story in hand. 